In today's video, we're going to check out some creepy TikToks. Let's get into it. You need something that the energy repels. Any metal will do. As the frequencies are sucked in by the resin, they're immediately repelled by the metal. So you have a high repulsion attraction frequencies, which is chaotic and unbalanced energy. And the crystals inside have the ability to transmute this chaotic, unbalanced energy. And it smooths it out. It balances it out. And what comes out of an orgone generator now is this smooth, harmonic, balanced, positive energy that all all living things want more of. Grass, pets, humans, anything that's alive, anything that's organic wants more of this good positive energy because we have too much of the negative and not enough of the positive. And when you're surrounded by orgone generators, you come into a state of balance and everything will work better. You will even have neighbors who've never said hi to you in years suddenly one morning will say, oh, hi, and blow you away. I do find organite technology pretty interesting. I'm kind of testing some things out myself. I have three different organite pyramids. I have a black organite pyramid, a tree of life pyramid, and a gold organite pyramid. There's uh, the tree of life is sitting right there and the golden one's right there. My black one sits on my desk here and supposedly they provide positive energy by absorbing negative energy through the quartz crystal and the copper there's a whole bunch of mechanics that work in it and i find it extremely interesting so there's one more video on organite and that's it i'll leave it alone but in the future i will update you on my thoughts about how organite generators work this is why your governments have been suppressing organite technology for decades now if this is your first time hearing about this technology make sure you pay attention and stay to the end now, this is the man who discovered organ energy. His name is William Reach. Not only did he discover it, but he actually was using it to cure people of many ailments and diseases. Now, shortly after his discovery, his lab was raided, his books were burned, and he was tossed in prison. I wonder why. Now, organite devices produce a very high-frequency energy similar to life force energy, and they're known to counteract the radiation from 5G, Y5, because they produce negative ion. That's why I wear one every single day. And just by doing a simple test with frozen water, you can see the immense energy coming off these things. Oh yeah, they also help with the yield and growth of plants. These are both planted the same day, given the same conditions, one with organite and one without. This is why farmers have used organites for decades in their fields. The biggest thing you'll notice when you keep these by your bedside, your dreams become incredibly vivid and lucid. The scientist behind the organ machine, it was just a big steel box that had a liner of wool, copper, steel, and apparently he would sit people in that box for 30 minutes an hour and most of these people had like cancer or tumors and slowly day by day each test results came back more positive than the last where people were losing their cancer that they had their their tumors would go down into size if not just completely go away so it's very interesting that this was a thing in the past that got pretty much shut down by the government and I think people are starting to realize uh, its potential and they're trying to bring it back. We'll see, though. If you've seen shadow figures since you were young, you might want to hear this perspective. I started seeing shadow figures when I was five years old. It did not stop until I was 21. I would see them almost nightly. I did not have to be in sleep paralysis to experience them. If you don't know what they are, they're essentially demonic beings that stand, at least for me, they were about six to seven feet tall, always cloaked, hood went to over their nose. I could never see their nose or their eyes, only their mouth. And um, the presence of evil was indescribable. Now, I have never in my life seen an angel. Never. I had a near-death experience when I was four, and I experienced the presence of God, and I've experienced the presence of Jesus, but never looking at this is a... While I was asking God, why did you only ever let me see the demonic realms? Why did it always have to be wickedness? Why couldn't I have just had one experience where I I'd seen an angel? Then I started questioning, like, am I a child of God, or what is this? And I got this answer clear as day, and I didn't get it for like 23 years. And it is, how could you know what you are to war against if you cannot recognize? 
I believe those of us who have seen these demonic entities since we were young were called to war in the spirit against them. Different people are called for different things. I understand that as disciples of Christ, you are taught to go out and cast out demons. So, so guess every Christian can, but there are some of us that we're called on a deeper level. See, we, we know what we're fighting because we've seen it. I know what I'm fighting even if I don't see them anymore because I immediately know when I'm in the presence of. So just food for thought. I'll talk more about it if you, you resonate. Oh, and please don't tell me that they're like positive spiritual entities and that I misrecognize them. This is pretty interesting. I'm not going to lie. When I was a kid, I also used to see shadow figures. Now, not to the detail that this individual said that she could see him with the hood and everything like that. Mine were blent in shadow figures that were in corners and things like that. It's really hard to explain. And uh, my mom actually had the same thing where it would be to the point where it would bother her so bad that it would ruin her whole day when she's seen one. And there's a bunch of examples that I could pull up. I'll just bring one up real quick. One time, she's seen a shadow person or whatever you want to call it on a tree and decided not to go to do this travel event that there was some reason that they had to travel. But because they seen or she's seen that shadow person, they decided not to travel that day. And it turns out on a major highway that we would have been traveling on, there was a super bad incident that happened that day, a really massive wreck. And we could have probably been involved in that if we would have continued going if she just ignored the shadow person. Now, it's been a long time since I've seen them. Not a long time. I still see things at the corner of my eye, but I just cop it up as just, I think I see something because I've never seen one full bodied before. It's always just a figure. And as soon as you lock eyes onto that figure, it disappears. Hey, if you haven't done so already, go ahead and like the video and subscribe to the channel. I only ask once per video and I make a video like this every day. Okay, guys, I think I found a real-life glitch. This is honestly so trippy, okay? I did not manipulate these photos. I have not edited these photos. You are going to just watch this video, and you're going to see something crazy, or maybe it's just me. So you're going to take a look. Right here in the center, you're going to stare at the cross in the center of these pictures. Now, don't get distracted and look elsewhere. Focus all of your attention at the cross in the middle of these photos. Now, as these photos start to change, you're going to see some of these faces, I don't know, like start to look like they've got some alien-like features, some reptilian-like features, but these photos are not edited, so I don't really understand how this is possible or what you're seeing. If you don't believe me, you can watch it again and only look at one photo at a time. You'll see that they're not edited photos at all. So if anyone can explain what the heck is happening, please let me know and follow for more. I think this is just a really fun trick of the brain. I, I like it a lot, but it makes you think, what if you're seeing their true form when your eyes aren't focused on them? Pretty fun little theory. Well, apparently on April 4th, there's a solar eclipse that's going to be happening. Multiple schools in the United States are going to shut down on this day because of the solar eclipse. So there's schools in Ohio, Kentucky, Arkansas, Maine, Indiana, Texas. Also, it's not just isolated. It's all over the United States. They're all going to shut down. So this sounds like this is a premeditated event again because it's not isolated nationwide. Why are they afraid that they think they need to send children home or they can't come to school for a solar eclipse. Probably because they've been watching too much television. I never heard in my entire life schools getting shut down because of a solar eclipse. But apparently all these schools all over the nation are, so. Well, it only lasts for like a few minutes. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. It's only a few minutes. That's why I think it's stupid. They go, Who, what school would do this? But they are. They're all saying we're shutting it down. So this seems like another premeditated event. It's almost like the news. When you hear the same thing on news channels all over the United States, somebody's telling them to say this stuff. So when you see a nationwide shutdown, somebody on the federal level is telling them something. I don't know exactly why they would take kids out of school for that day. 
I do know that normally when solar eclipses happen, it does happen in certain areas and a lot of new people travel to those areas to view the event. So maybe it's because they want to just make sure that random people in your town are, I, I, I really don't know. I, I have no clue. Leave a comment down below on what you guys think it could be because honestly, I'm spinning gears trying to figure out why. I, I thought I had something, but I don't think it is that. There are three big lies that, that we as citizens of Earth are facing. Can you go into depth with each of those three lies? Sure, absolutely. The first one, Elizondo and that crowd stood up and started saying, It is my uh, belief that the United States is in possession of, uh, of exotic material. And unfortunately, that's about all I can, I can say at this time. Yeah, well, there's something out there, and here's this footage. But we don't know what they are. Now, ironically, the footage that they were showing were from the Lockheed Skunk Works. I know who worked on them. I know where they're, de they're deployed from. I have a photograph of the underground entry port for those out in the Mojave Desert. The second big lie is that we don't know how these operate. Well, that's what they want everyone to believe, because if they were acknowledged, we know how these function that are electrogravitic mm -hmm. anti-gravs. The date that breakthrough happened, where we had a stable anti-grav system, was October 1954. The other issue is uh, that there, that these extraterrestrial civilizations are a threat. Uh, let me assure everyone, they view us as a threat. If they were hostile, they were so far, they're so far advanced with us, they just shut this whole civilization down. It's in the interest of the warmongering, endless war, psychopaths and sociopaths to convince the world population that there's a threat from out there. That's pretty interesting. I did not know if this is real, but I did not know that they have pretty much made an anti-gravity machine back in the 50s. I find that extremely fascinating. That means if they have made a machine that is anti-gravity capable, then that just means it has to be so much more advanced today. So I'm very interested in if this is real or not, because I want to believe what Mr. Greer is saying, but it's so hard to believe sometimes. I mean, he is one of many whistleblowers, but he's probably one of my favorite ones. Do you know there's a conspiracy regarding fog? And I found a CIA document about it. The CIA in 1967, they were doing tests to see how they can implement man-made fog to where no one can drive. And then, but at the bottom of it, it literally says top secret. If the military can produce something for cheap, that's strategic in wartime, deters from any signals getting through, it's like, of course they're going to duplicate everything they yeah. can. We have all of these tactical approaches to like combat and stuff like that. But what are the vulnerabilities that we can't predict? Things that we can't control? Weather. It stops people from moving. People literally cannot drive through it. Like, literally controls people. Yeah. So it's like, why would the government not be interested in that? Yeah. yeah. I also kind of believe that our governments are trying to do weather modification, mainly at the moment with cloud seeding, because I think that's the only way that they can do it. I, I would love for weather modification to work in our favor. It always is catastrophe whenever we have bad weather and it's horrible. I just wish that, oh, there's a horrible storm coming. We can actually dissipate it. And now we don't have to worry about the catastrophe that follows along with it. But more or less, they're just worried about creating the catastrophe. And that's, that's just sucky. This is going to be one of the craziest videos you see today. This witness received an inheritance from his grandmother. And as he's going through the box, it becomes unbelievable and even more unbelievable. So many questions arise. Either his grandmother was a witch or he's from a family of hunters. Take a look at this video and tell me what you think. My grandma was from Ireland. And this is the box she left me. Stuff you get left by your grandma. Not sure where that came from. Anyway. The mummified leprechaun.
Never seen anything like this before in my life. This is a mummified leprechaun. And it looks absolutely awesome. And it said it could be human skin suit. Which is a wow. The point down there. There I'm going to get this one, which is a banshee. Which is, looks pretty awesome. Now these are over, well over 100 years old. So, who the hell leaves you these? This bottle of coins, silver coins, never opened. So, everybody can tell me about them. Leather bottles. My nana was into witchcraft, so if anybody knows what these mean or what it's about, please let us know. And there was this other stuff. Well, it's just crazy. That's pretty bizarre. I really would like to know more about that. That was interesting. Like, that did look like a little person. I don't know if it maybe was just a prop item for witchcraft or whatnot way back in the day, or if it really was a leprechaun. I, I have no clue. It looked very authentic. Whoa, guys. Help, lad. Whoa. Fuck that, guys. I'm out. I've been recording for this. Right, you little bastard, got you. Start it again, guys. Over the bedroom, so. Whoa, you're taking the fucking piss? What? Bad enough. Fuck off. Priest, tomorrow, Sunday. It's time. Guys, the fucking shit I've got to go through. Fuck that. Got you. Wow, don't like that. What time to go, guys? Do not like that's the first time for that. He's gonna keep playing around and he's gonna get really messed up. I don't know if I believe this necessarily, but it, it looked pretty convincing. The only thing that I just hate is that everything basically came towards him, which indicates to me he had it on a string and he was pulling it towards himself, but the blinds and the door opening and the lights cutting off is pretty interesting. And the fact that his whole bed got pushed, that was, that was pretty intense as well. We all know the Earth is actually okay. No, nah, no, nah, we're not doing that. What? Yeah, we're doing this for real. Oh, why do I have to be that guy? What is beyond the ice wall of Antarctica? Disclaimer: obviously a theory and should be considered for entertainment purposes only. Yes, this is the ridiculous Earth plane theory, or at least a part of it. Now, personally, I think this map is complete bullcrap. There's just countless evidence that goes against it. Before ever even considering a theory, you always need to look for some sort of tangible proof. And these mysterious blue shards reported in a leak from Antarctic research labs are a little more revealing. They were leaked by this helicopter engineer who was contracted to work at McMurdo Station in Antarctica from 1997 to the year 2000. <laughs> and if you don't know, McMurdo Station is usually where sh 
goes down. So this engineer, let's call him Jimmy Boy, claimed that he befriended a few of the scientists doing research there in 1998. The scientists told him that they had two types of ice they worked with down there. There was this ice that they drilled cores out of boreholes in the ground that was cold to the touch, usually clear or some shade of white, and melted into water. Almost all of Antarctica is covered with this type of ice, which is just normal ice. Clearly, this wasn't their main focus of research. The only times they ever actively study this ice is when film crews from like National Geographic Geographic came down to film a documentary. The other 95% of the time, they studied the forbidden sky ice, totally different than the ice that we're used to. Jimmy wasn't allowed in the labs where they studied sky ice because it was, you know, super duper top secret. But one time, one of the scientists he got close with showed him a piece of the ice and it was unlike any other matter he's ever seen on Earth. First of all, you couldn't touch it with your bare hands and had to wear your heavy duty South Pole exploration gloves when holding it because of how cold it was. Secondly, as you can tell, it was this solid deep blue color, allegedly composed mainly of oxygen and is why they call called it sky ice. And oh man, I haven't even scratched the surface of how deep this goes. Oxygen has a freezing point of about negative 218 degrees Celsius, which is when it turns into a solid, so you'd practically get frostbite just by looking at it. Jimmy held it for a bit with his gloves, of course, noting that it was lighter than regular ice, almost like he could have thrown it up in the air and it would have floated back down. It was also slightly flexible and completely opaque, so you couldn't see through it at all. And it didn't even melt into water when it got warm, but just continually shrank until it ceased to exist, likely turning direct into oxygen gas, which is why they had to study it in Antarctica. They couldn't even transport it to anywhere in the world before it disappeared. The Russians knew about this too, and it's part of the reason they all have research stations down there. After 15 minutes or so, the sky ice was almost completely gone, and Jimmy asks his research friend where they even get this ice from. And this is where it gets interesting. Because to that, the scientist replied, they get it from the wall. According to him, if you go deep enough, hundreds of kilometers inland from the coast, you'll run into a huge wall in Antarctica that contains this sky ice, the biggest natural structure in the world. This sounds a lot like the infamous ice wall from the um, pancake earth theory, which states there's a giant wall of ice that surrounds our entire planet. And there's even more land beyond this wall if you somehow manage to get past it, including the legendary lands of Atlantis, Mew, the Garden of Eden, and even Asgard. Obviously just an incredible stretch of a theory, but interesting to see the ice wall mentioned in a scientific setting here. Now buckle in, cause this is where it actually gets insane, in case you felt like it wasn't already. The US has known about this sky ice for decades, and back in the 60s, they actually tried boring a tunnel through the ice wall. They built a special boring machine made for the super cold temperatures of the sky ice wall and started digging. For the first two miles or so, the floor was solid rock, but after that, even the ground under them became the bright blue sky ice, until they got about 5 to 10 miles deep after an entire year of boring, which is pretty damn far and still no sight of the other side. When they realized the tunnel was shrinking and eventually got so small that they could barely even move their machine anymore. Turns out sky ice, when exposed to warmer temperatures, just dissipates into thin air, but in colder temperatures, like inside the tunnel, it regenerates itself. Eventually, the tunnel got so tight, it became too difficult to continue boring, so they scrapped the project, ditched the machine, and after many decades, the hole they dug into the wall has now been completely sealed. Now, some people say this sky ice wall sounds almost exactly like what would be called the dome, or the firmament in the, um, horizontal earth, or at least fragments of it, and even the most popular book in the world had something to say about it. Ezekiel 126 reads, and above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone. Now, whether you believe in the Bible or not, we can all agree it is by definition a historic text text that was written sometime in history. Firmament over their heads? Appearance of a sapphire stone? I mean, I really, really don't want to believe this is true, and who knows, maybe this entire sky ice Antarctica story is just completely made up, but as always, what if? I like the sky ice theory. I think it's really cool. My biggest complaint though, if you're a group of scientists and you bore a hole so far into the wall, why did you let it close back up? You could have easily have put a heating system in there to keep the ice from reconstructing itself. So that makes it a little unbelievable. Maybe they did do that and they just kept it off the record and they're still studying it. I really would enjoy that to be a true theory that would be really neat i just find it to be kind of hard to believe what do you guys think you guys think sky ice is real or do you think that it's just a theory ah! <laughs> All right. thank you very much everyone for being here i deeply appreciate it i'm gonna let Bashar come through and say what he's going to say and then open it up for questions so Please have a good time. I'll see you all later. Bye. See you all later. You're welcome.
All right, I'll take a day to you this day of your time. How are you all? Yeah. Right. Right. I'll take that as fine. <laughs> we thank you for the co-creation of this interaction, this day of your time. We will begin this transmission by letting you know we are now beginning a new phase of information. In this, your year of 2024, we have been transmitting to your people for the past 40 of your years, 40 years being the typical cycle for the transformation of an entire culture on your planet. And now we are beginning a new cycle. We are beginning what we term the Interstellar Alliance Social Experiment Countdown to Contact Year One. Now, what this means is this. In the streaming sessions that we create with you, once a month, we are delivering now information, actions, suggestions that will, if you are willing to act on them, bring your vibration closer and closer over time to the interstellar alliance frequency and the frequency of open contact in the years ahead. I find Bashar's content pretty interesting. I want to believe it, but it's really difficult for me to believe it because it's kind of so showboaty. It's, it's basically a performance. I, I feel like it's more of a stunt than it is real, but I would like to believe it to be real. So leave a comment down below if you guys believe that this is an, a, a real event and a real thing that's happening with this individual, or if you think that this is a act. I do want to know so what the aliens everything. look the, like. The, the one, for example, that uh, healed this man's hearing who is in our circle. Uh, sort of very triangular head, uh, about five and a half feet tall. Uh, he popped in transdimensionally. That's an actual ET extraterrestrial that came into our CE5 uh, circle. Oh, the space time bow is black there. You, and that's, that's the energy field that they can teleport in. I saw this red light come right into our circle and then a photograph taken. And this ET is standing right beside this man. And he had permanent hearing loss since he was a teenager. And he was fixed that night by this ET. That is a true story. It's a were, beautiful story. Were you there? Yeah, I was there. I, the, the, the ET was about two feet from me. We're dealing with civilizations that are, you know, 100,000 to a few million years ahead of us. The so the, the way that they're going to uh, appear in and out of our uh, space time, un, un go out wherever you live all over the world and initiate contact with these civilizations. That's the next big step. I find this extremely interesting, and I like that he has photos. I just wish that the photos were better quality. You would think that a scientist would have like top gear for this kind of event so that they can capture very accurate and detailed information on footage or photo, but it's always such a blurry photo, and that's that bothers me so much. But it is interesting. The text itself dates back to 300 BC, and is noted as being more of an ancient Jewish text, but does maintain a place in some modern Christian and Jewish traditions. Enoch himself, which the book is named after, is referenced in the book of Genesis, and is detailed as being an ancestor of Noah. One of the most prominent figures in the book of Enoch are the Watchers, angelic beings described as being both the sons of God and the sons of heaven in chapter 7. Many believe that the Watchers, referred to as the Gregori in Enoch 2, were angels who watched over the human race and would serve as earthly guides for the very first humans. They were tasked with the observing of human development, but were restricted from interfering with mankind, regardless of how compelled they felt to do so. Enoch tells us in chapter 7 that human men and women had multiplied and that the daughters of man were beautiful and elegant. It's understood that their beauty was so great that they caught the attention of the Watchers, these sons of God, if you will. The Watchers conversed amongst each other in this chapter and decided to take the women for themselves, impregnating them with their seed 
thus going against the intended purpose of watching and directly interfering with the life of mankind. The leader of these angels, known as Samjaza, sometimes pronounced Samyaza, tells the watchers that they should reconsider their choice and that it would be him who suffered for such a crime against God. However, the other angels wear him down and tell him that together they will face the punishment and that they will each accept responsibility for any repercussions. It's noted in total that there were 200 of them and together they descended upon earth to take the women as their wives. The Book of Enoch even names the prefects of the Watchers here, each of whom would teach the mortal women sorcery, incantations, and the dividing of roots and trees. What's implied here is that the Watchers divulged information about the heavens and life itself that God had not intended for man to know, and so by doing this, the Watchers not only betrayed God by copulating with his creations, but also by corrupting them with knowledge that was not meant for them. The women then gave birth to the children of the Watchers, and what they spawn are essentially a hybrid of angel and human, the Nephilim, as they are sometimes referred to as. There is some debate as to what the Nephilim are, but when we look at Genesis 6, 1-4, it tells us that the Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterwards, when the sons of God, which we might say are the Watchers, went to the daughters of men and had children with them. The Nephilim are also described as heroes of old and men of renown. However, in Enoch, the spawn of the women are known as giants, and that these giants began to consume all that man had built. The giants, or Nephilim, then began to kill man, and when they were tired of that, they began killing each other. During this chaos, we learn in chapter 8 that an entity known as Azazel, who is presumed to be a watcher, teaches man the use of swords knives and warfare, much as the Watchers taught mankind the secrets of heaven, incantations and sorcery. Azazel also teaches mankind the use of paint, stones and dyes, so that man can manipulate the world and alter it. In 8.2 we learn that these acts by Azazel caused impiety to increase, fornification multiplied, and that these transgressions corrupted all of man's ways. The rest of the chapter tells us that the other Watchers taught mankind astrology, signs, astronomy, and that with their presence, men were destroyed and their cries reached the heights of heaven. In chapter 9, Archangel Michael, Gabriel, Raphael and Uriel looked down from heaven and realized what was going on on earth. In this chapter, they go before God and seem to pin most of the blame on Azazel, saying, you have seen what Azazel has done, how he has taught every species of iniquity upon earth, and has disclosed to the world all the secret things which are done in the heavens. They also blame Samjaza, saying he has taught the mortal sorcery, and that he and his watchers have copulated with the women, creating ungodly giants. They ask God what he will have them do to bring restoration upon earth. In chapter 10, God then sends Uriel to seek the son of Lamech, which is Noah, and tells him to conceal himself and to explain to him what is about to take place, in that all of the earth shall perish in a flood, and that everything which has come to be will be destroyed. He tells Uriel to tell Noah how to escape the flood and how it is his seed that will remain in all of earth. God then tells Archangel Raphael to bind Azazel by hand and foot and to cast him into the darkness by opening the desert, which is in Dudale, a region of the underworld. He tells Raphael to throw upon him pointed stones, and to cover him in the darkness, so that Azazel will remain there forever, devoid of all light. On the great day of judgment, God is set to task Raphael with casting Azazel into the fire. God tells Archangel Gabriel to destroy the Nephilim, the giants, or the offspring of the Watchers, by turning them against one another. He intends for them to perish by mutual slaughter. God finally tells Archangel Michael to confront the leader of the Watchers, Samjaza, and to tell him that he and his allies, who had fornicated with the women, that they are polluted, and that their sons, whether their own angelic sons, or the sons they have fathered with the mortal women, 
will be slain before their eyes for seventy generations. Then, after witnessing the butchering of their offspring, they will be taken to the lower depths of hell, where they will meet fire and be locked away forever. By chapter 12, we are told that Enoch was engaged by the Watchers, and that they called him Enoch the Scribe. It appears that God tells Enoch to relay his message to the Watchers, that they will never ever have peace as a result of what they have done. There seems to be an inconsistency here, because Archangel Michael would have no doubt already done this, as God had asked him to do so in the previous chapter. It could be that Enoch is told to do this so as to exemplify God's message, in that the watchers are being told by both the archangels who are above them, and by the mortals who are beneath them. By having Enoch tell them their fate, it shows the watchers that they are no longer above mankind in God's eyes, for they are being told their fate by a man, thus putting them on the same level, and maybe even above them. In chapter 12, 5 through 7, he states, Then the Lord said to me, Enoch, scribe of righteousness, go tell the watchers of heaven, who have deserted the lofty sky and their holy everlasting station, who have been polluted with women, and have done as the sons of men do, by taking to themselves wives, and who have been greatly corrupted on earth, that on the earth they shall never obtain peace and remission of sin. For they shall not rejoice in their offspring, they shall behold the slaughter of their beloved, shall lament for the destruction of their sons, and shall petition forever. So, I'm starting to get into the Book of Enoch, at least in the digital form, like on TikTok and whatnot. I've still not purchased the book. I don't know if I will. And I don't even know if this is true to the Book of Enoch, to be honest. I'm hoping that you guys in the comments can tell me whether it is or is not. But this was really interesting, and it makes me question a few things. Like, what is up with Earth being so corruptive that it even corrupts angels basically like that's just crazy this was a pretty interesting listen i'm sorry it took so long it is fairly lengthy but i do expect to pull up more of this type of content in the future uh just to get a feel see what you guys think about it as well before i really go all in with it and do a bunch of them throughout my videos uh but this was pretty fun all right guys i'm gonna go ahead and end the video here and with that being said have a good day